Hello and welcome back to Pharmacist Diaries. Today we are back with Gina Baria, who is the current Global Medical Director at GSK and the CEO and founder of Farm Affinity. We are here at episode two talking about all the skills that you need to get into the pharmaceutical industry as well as the skills that you'll need once you're in, in the actual role. So we are going to be talking about networking, we are going to be talking about storytelling, and we're going to be talking about delivering. A few topics that probably haven't come up in your kind of mindset when it comes to industry roles, but let's find out what Gina has to say. Hello again. Here we are again for episode two. Um, I guess we should just dive in today and talk about these three skills. In the first episode um, of this series, we talked about networking um, as a really important and valuable skill that you need in terms of industry. Um, So this might be a little bit of a recap of episode one, but also we'll go into a little bit more detail. So I guess uh, revisit the story of uh, Gina when she was first going into the pharmaceutical industry and trying to find that job and the networking piece. Yeah. So I guess that that would be my kind of first skill set that I would say that people need to um, consider working on and developing if they want to move into industry. Um, as you said, we touched on it uh, in the previous podcast, but networking is, is a crucial skill. It is incredibly important to be able to network, to be able to speak to people, to be able to convey your messaging, to be able to um, build that rapport, build those relationships. Um, and as I mentioned in the previous podcast, you know, it was something that I I struggled with initially. I was very naive. I didn't really understand what networking was. I thought it was just kind of reaching out to people and asking for help. That's not networking. That is um, absolutely not networking. Um, networking is about that relationship. It is about building that rapport. And there are good ways of networking and there are bad ways of networking. And I think when you first start trying to build your network and you first start talking to people, it's not always easy to know what to say. It's not always easy to know who to reach out to. And I think that is kind of the first point to start at. It's thinking, right, okay, I want to build my network. What is the best way to do it? Now, a lot of people don't really realize that they have a network, right? They already have friends. They already have family. They are part of your network. And you can use your network to further develop and grow. So for me, getting my first role, I mentioned it was a family member that knew somebody, that knew somebody. And eventually I got put in front of the hiring manager. So it's about asking for those connections. It's about asking for those introductions. Use your current network. Ask them if they know somebody that's going to be um, helpful to you. It might not be someone who's helpful to you immediately. But if you think that they'll be helpful in the future, start that relationship now. Nurture it. Bring it to life. Don't just kind of reach out to people when you need them. Start developing a rapport and start building your network even when you don't need people. So that would kind of be my first tip is to kind of build those relationships even when you don't need them. Make sure that you're growing your network organically, not just kind of pushing your, um, pushing your needs to somebody. Um, but it is difficult to do. Networking is is a skill and it's not one that we're taught. We're not taught how to network. You know, you don't go to university and have a lecture on how do you network? How do you um, build a rapport? How do you build relationships? That's not something that we're ever taught. And even in hospital or community, you know, that's again, something that you don't really have to do. You don't have to build a network you build, you you have colleagues, right? But you don't actually go out there and think, okay, who do I need to talk to? Who can help me with my career? Who is it that I need um, around me to support me, to learn from, to develop? Um, Who is it that I am inspired by, that I want to learn more from? You don't really, you don't really do that. You might do that with your line manager, perhaps, but not in the, the bigger sense. Also in a, in a hospital role, the actual tasks, objectives and things that you need to do in terms of your routine yeah. are set out for you. You know that you need to come in at 9am, maybe a team huddle, 
You might go up to the pharmacy to do your TPN round super early in the morning to get those orders in. You might start doing your drug histories. Hey guys, before we get into this week's episode, I really want to remind you about the discount code that I have for the nakedpharmacy.com. As my listeners or viewers of the podcast, you'll receive a 20% discount using the code PD20. Both myself, my husband and my children are using the products and we're absolutely loving them. I really want to advocate for this brand because number one, it's owned and created by a pharmacist, Kevin leaders. He has over 35 years of experience working in the industry of natural medicines and has created his own company and provided us with so many different products to support our needs. For me personally, I absolutely love their gut health products, the magnesium for my sleep and Safrasun Energy. Because as a mum of two very young children, working full time and juggling the day-to-day life that I have, I really need that extra support to keep me energized and going throughout the day. I also want to let you know that if you're not sure where to start with your supplement regime, Kevin has a team of multiple pharmacists that you can either contact by phone, email or on social media to get some support on where to get started. Check out their website, thenakedpharmacy.com. Now let's get back to the episode. Do, you know, orders for medications that have come up the night before. You might look at stock. You then are doing all of your kind of medicines reconciliation and reviewing your clinical charts and your patients and then you kind of start on the discharges you have lunch you might come back to the ward to do further discharging for the rest of the day you may be doing some teaching to maybe your trainee pharmacists or sometimes we do teaching to medical students um you may have meetings but your day-to-day function as a pharmacist is pretty much same same and it's not the kind of job where you need to figure out what your day-to-day looks like and how you manage your time, um, what activities that you do. All hospital pharmacists run a similar kind of like pathway in terms of their routine, especially if you're on a ward or in a clinic setting. If you're in a clinic setting, it's even more kind of given to you because you've got a set of patients that you have to see and it's tick them off. And the same with the GP practice, right? You've got like your your list of patients that you go through in the day and you you get it done, right? Um, when you're in the industry, I feel like a lot of the work that needs to be done, of course, there are rules, regulations, tasks, objectives that need to be done. But I think you can be quite creative and innovative and use your network to actually grow and learn in terms of the experience that you need to become a better professional. It's not just laid out for you. There is an expectation that you need to do your own homework and your groundwork in order to build your career. Am I wrong? Yeah, no, absolutely. So I think in industry, networking is your bread and butter, particularly if you're externally facing. So if you're externally facing, so if you're an MSL role, for example, you will be expected to talk to clinicians. You'll be expected to build those relationships um, because ultimately you will be needing to use your network to achieve your own goals, the things that you put in your development plan, the things that you say that you're going to go out and achieve, you will need to use your network to help you achieve those. So absolutely, I think um, in industry, networking is, is key and you need the people around you to help you achieve your goals. And I guess even if you're not externally facing, if you're internally, if you, if you kind of, you don't, um, you don't speak to clinicians, you just kind of work very much internal in your organization you still need to be able to network because you have to work cross-functionally. You have to work with, um, with different teams, with, with commercial, with market access, with regulatory, with, um, with various different people. And sometimes if you're in a, in a global position, you'll have to work with people in different countries, people you don't have um, sort of direct authority over, and you will need them to work with you so that you can achieve your goals. And you can really only do that if you can effectively network, if you can build those relationships, if you can get people on side, if you can get people to want to help you. That is um, that is going to help you do your job. It's really hard. Like even when you're when you're conveying this information, I'm I'm vis- I'm visualizing you at work right now. 
Um, and I'm thinking about all the relationships that you need to be able to build. And you do have to start from that kind of cold call, don't you? Or a cold email to say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm doing. I need help with blah, blah, blah. You know, are you available for a discussion as an example? But you might not always get an answer or maybe you utilize your network to, to make that introduction, right? Because that will help you in order to get someone to say, oh, okay, cool. So-and-so's made the introduction. I'll definitely make time to support them in this journey. I'll give a good story about when I moved to the UAE and I moved to Dubai and I obviously knew no one, knew nothing about pharmacy, didn't know much about the job market and rocked up spontaneously, hoping everything would work out. And it took me 11 months to get a job, which I've shared the, the story of how long it took in multiple other episodes of the podcast, especially in my first episode where I share my journey. But networking became a massive part of my life in those 11 months because jobs were just not available through the internet. There was no NHS, you know, jobs website. There was hardly any kind of recruitment agencies focusing on pharmacy, which really surprised me because there are so many hospitals and clinics and facilities where you would think the jobs are available. But it was only once I got there that I realized that the number of clinical pharmacists per hospital was, you know, 1% compared to the number of clinical pharmacists here in the UK. At that time, which is back in um, 2013, um, there was only four or five clinical pharmacists per hospital. And those positions you know, just never became available because people would stay. They would not leave because, again, the job market was very different to what we are used to. And being able to get into the pharmacy department meant I would have to rock up and, again, build that network. I was trying to be friendly with the pharmacists and get to know them, get a phone number, get an email address, rocking up to the pharmacy department and saying, can I come in? which was so awkward, and handing in a physical paper CV. So you're, you felt like you were really having to sell yourself because there was no job descriptions online. There were no adverts for jobs online, which I could apply to. So the only option I had was to literally drive in a rental car to every facility I could find and try to meet somebody. I ended up going to a lot of pharmacy conferences and just utilize this opportunity just to get to know people, make friends with people within the pharmacy space, and then understand where they're at in their job, and then keep in touch with them for months on end. Just saying hello, reaching out, how are you, want to go out for a coffee, you know, anything, just so that if an opportunity came up in their department, they would then be able to tell me about it, because that would be one of the only ways that I would learn about job opportunities. I applied for every recruitment agency I could find online um, and eventually it was chance that someone contacted me from one of those recruitment agencies and that's how I kind of landed my first job. Um, but with regards to getting a job at Cleveland Clinic, um, I went, I had a friend who worked there and she very kindly helped me to get in front of the pharmacy director. And it took multiple conversations of going to turn up to the department and sitting in front of his desk in order to even get the initial interview. Um, my initial interview had nine people on the panel, which was, yeah, quite scary for, you know, a clinical pharmacist role and not the same as what we would expect here in, in, in the UK. Nine people is a lot of people. Um, and then even in the job, there was so much that I didn't know. When I worked for emergency services, I had to import drugs from all over the world. I had no idea how to do that. I had no idea about procurement and supply chain. I had no contacts whatsoever. And one of the things I did in terms of network was to go to a local hospital where I had a friend. She introduced me to their supply chain team and I would rock up, just drive and rock up, say hello and go in and start asking them questions and just say, look, I'm really struggling with getting this particular drug. Um, I'm really struggling with, you know, ordering a small quantity because we were quite a small organization at that time. So a lot of the suppliers 
would not even give me an order of 50 EpiPens. You know, they wanted 500. Because you're importing from other countries, they want large orders. Otherwise, it's not really valuable for them. And that was a real barrier for me because I needed to get supply of medications and I didn't know how to do it because I was faced with obstacles along the way. So I utilised that hospital and the people who work there and I just became really friendly and just kind. I would like bring them gifts like dates and chocolates out of genuine like desperation to be able to do my job because I was the only pharmacist in this organisation in emergency services. So there was no one else to rely on. No one understood pharmacy. They expected me to know it all. They expected me to figure it out. And I didn't have a network. So it was, it was like a trap, yeah. you know, but I figured it out and I found a network of people to support me along the journey. And it was a lot of hard, awkward work of meeting up with people that I didn't know and just kind of showing up and like asking for information, but in a really kind, friendly way. And that, that part of my personality genuinely helped me because making friends for me is super easy. And though it was very uncomfortable rocking up to a hospital where you know no one, I really needed to push forward with my objectives. Otherwise, those ambulances wouldn't have the medications that I needed to give them. So I had to go above and beyond and do strange things <laughs> um, in order to, again, build the network, build the number of people that I know, make connections with people who do have those answers and who can support me on my journey and help me. And in fact, I ended up, um, for some of the orders, I would wholesale supply off large hospitals, which is not common practice. But again, in order to solve my problem, they would be ordering loads and loads of different drugs and, and need those for all of their anaphylaxis kits and things like that in the hospital. And I would just purchase 20 at a time because I couldn't get those international imports from suppliers because my orders were too small. And things like EpiPens would take nine months to come through. Um, and I didn't know anyone at the airport. So sometimes you do um, like a, an import form and it may take multiple months for those drugs to arrive. But I didn't have a contact at the airport to find out where my medications were stuck in the process. And there was a strange rule that if one person's form for that particular drug was incorrectly filled, no one's drugs would be released. So there were all these weird barriers that I would never face in a UK setting that I'd never even had exposure to because I didn't know much about supply chain and procurement when I worked in the UK. As a band six pharmacist, you, you know a little bit, but you really don't have a lot of knowledge on that topic area. So it was something that I had to build and that, that really supported me. So I completely understand where you're coming from but it's it's a totally different topic it's not about industry but building a network and finding ways to communicate and build that rapport gain relationships with people can be the be all end all of getting a job and doing doing absolutely. it well absolutely and as you said you know when you move into another job or if you are trying to progress there will be aspects of your job that you don't know how to do and you will need your network, you'll need people to help support you to do those. So yeah, absolutely. Um, I think the kind of the best way and probably the tip that I would give people who are trying to trying to grow their network is, is to utilize their current network, is to try and get those introductions. And if you can't get an introduction to somebody that um, you want to network with or you want in your network, then, you know, there are some there are some questions that you just shouldn't ask in a cold call or a cold email. And I know you've had lots of experience of doing that when you were in Dubai, having to kind of just rock up, turn up and kind of talk to people and ask people um, for help. But um, I guess in industry, there is, a, there is a good way of doing that. And then there's a, there's a bad way of doing that. And one of my pet peeves is uh, when people message on LinkedIn sort of asking, I'm interested in a role within industry. Um, what job should I apply for? And I get asked that question quite a lot. And it's a really difficult question for somebody to answer because it really depends on the person. It depends on the person's experience. It depends on their goals. It depends on what they want from a career. It's not a simple question to respond to. Um, 
even if you know all of these things, you know, it's not easy to kind of say to somebody what job they should apply for. Nobody really knows what job anyone should apply for unless they're a coach or a career advisor or whatever that might be. But generally, people in industry won't know what job someone should apply for. So that question is just not a great question to ask when you're building your network. Um, what someone could end up thinking is that actually this person lacks awareness. You know, if they're asking what job should I apply for, clearly they haven't done their research because they haven't read upon what different roles are available. They haven't looked at um, what they think would be suitable for them. They're kind of just going in and asking somebody to do all the hard work for them. So immediately somebody's already thinking, right, that person lacks awareness. They're, they're, they don't know what they want. They're, and they're probably less inclined to help them. So I would say, try not to ask that question when you're, when you're reaching out to people, when you're trying to build a network. Consider asking more personal questions, um, asking more about their, their, their journey, their challenges, what they enjoy about their role, um, more open-ended questions. Um, but ideally, you would be in a situation where you're being introduced. So, you know, for example, if you do go to a farm affinity event, you're at a networking event. People are expected to be networking. So it's not, um, you know, you're not going to be talking to somebody who doesn't want to help you. Everybody at the farm affinity networking event is there to help. So it's just a little bit more, a little bit more comfortable, a little bit easier. Um, the conversations can flow a little bit better. But if you do reach out, cold call, cold message. I wouldn't recommend asking what job you should apply for. It's, it's really, it's, it's, um, it's, you want to reach out to people because you think, A, LinkedIn is a great place to network, right? You're building connections with people and you send someone a genuine message. But at the same time, you have to understand how you're being perceived when you send that message. And asking a question like that means that you are totally unaware of the different types of roles that are available within the industry, which at this point, I agree, a lot of students, trainee pharmacists, early career pharmacists don't know where to look, which is where Farm Affinity is Absolutely. perfect in this situation. But a lot of people don't know where to look to find that information to then grow their knowledge and then get to the point where they send a message. They are trying to gain that knowledge by randomly making connections with people, which is, it's really tough. And it's this episode and this conversation is helping me to realize how much more I need to do as a podcaster in the career space on the pharmaceutical industry. There is so much that I, even I personally, don't know about the different roles that are in the pharmaceutical industry. And if I were to have a look on Google right now, I don't think that I would find that much. So it's obviously very useful that you've created um, a website and loads of resources for people to start this journey. And I think this networking piece is a great place for them to make a start. Get onto the website, sign up to the resources, have a look where to start and start aligning the different roles and your skills with what type of skills are needed in order to do that job so that you can understand where you fit in and where you might potentially want to go. Absolutely. Um, and also, I guess if you're, if you're listening and you're in university, there are internships within industry. There are internships within medical affairs, within market access, within all different types of departments, within, within industry. And I'd say if people are genuinely interested in a career within industry, I would highly recommend that they look at these internships because that is going to be one of the best places to grow your network. Agreed. And a lot of people, actually a lot of students um, that I teach ask how to find those inter internships, like where do they look for them? And most of the time it's on the company's website, right? Um, am I, is there anywhere else that you can find them? So uh, sometimes they're... Um, on LinkedIn. If I do see them, I tend to post them out to my network. So, um, so yeah, there's the, that, but it tends to be on the, on the company's websites. Okay. So people need to just start doing the homework. Yes. Um, which is tough. And this is part of getting into industry is you've got to work hard and you've got to persist and you've got to do the homework in order to succeed. It's not going to come to you. Exactly. And it's, 
I guess there's another kind of barrier or challenge that students might face in that their degree isn't really um, created to do an internship or to take a year out to to do um, an undergrad program at one of the pharma companies. So I've spoken to people who are doing internships within um, within GSK and they've had to speak to their course directors and they've had to kind of take a year out to do an internship and then go back and join the year below and carry on with their degree. So um, if people are interested, then like you said, it is difficult. There will be challenges, but it can be done. You've got to think outside the box and you've got to also look at the bigger picture. Not everything is going to be laid out for you. So you might need to do things that are non-traditional, which I think kind of sums up industry altogether. Because when you look at community pharmacy, GP practice and hospital, everything is, you know, set in terms of a pathway. And it's, it, it feels like industry is a, a non-traditional role, but one where you can thrive, but you've got to put in the work to make it happen, which is great. Let's get into skill number two, which is all about um, storytelling. So tell us a little bit why, a little bit about why you chose storytelling as a really valuable and important skill in terms of industry. Yeah, so um, storytelling. So storytelling, uh, again, is um, it's a difficult skill set, right? You, again, you're not taught it at university. And as a pharmacist, um, as someone who's really clinical, all about the data, you really very rarely use a storytelling skill set. But it is hugely important. It's how we communicate. It's how people will remember facts and figures and remember things. Um, but we, we rarely use it. If, you know, when I was in hospital, it was really just kind of getting those facts across to your patients, just kind of telling them, okay, this is your medication, this is your dose, this is when you take it. Or when you're talking to doctors, you're kind of telling them, okay, you need to prescribe this. This is where the, the, the issue is. You, you very rarely tell a story. Now, I am generalizing because there are instances where as a pharmacist, you do need to use um, the storytelling skill set when you're trying to invoke behavioral change or whatever that might be for your patient. Um, and we do have a subset of skills for storytelling. So we do ask those open-ended questions. We do tend to look at um, kind of people's body language and stuff. So we can kind of understand how people are responding to what we're saying. But generally, storytelling is something that we're, we're not great at, but it is super important. It's super important when it comes to your interview. So when you're talking about yourself, that very first interview question, um, particularly within industry is, okay, tell me a little bit about yourself, about your career. And what your interviewer is looking for at that moment is for you to tell a very, very high level story about your career, but making sure that you kind of get in all of the, um, all of the aspects that are important for the role that you're applying for. So getting in everything that's in that job description in your backstory, showing them that you've got the experience, you've got the skills that they require from the job description and getting that across in your story of your, of your career. So that's kind of the first place that I would say storytelling is really important. But once you're actually in industry and you're communicating, so if you're externally facing and you're talking to your healthcare professionals and you're kind to, trying to um, explain your product data, no one is going to remember all of these facts and figures. No one's going to remember pieces of data. They're going to remember a story. So it's really important that you can tell a story. You can tell, um, you can have a nice flow of information that people can kind of remember and hold on to. And even internally, you know, if you're, um, if you're delivering a strategy, no one's going to remember a 10 point strategy. No one's going to remember an hour long slide deck. They'll remember your story. So storytelling is incredibly important. How have you built this skill over time? So I would say that <laughs> I was really bad at storytelling. I was just, um, so in terms of my personality, I'm very much just kind of, I just want to know the facts. I don't want any fluff. So for me, storytelling, storytelling is really hard because I just want to tell people what they want to know. I just want to tell them 
A, B, C. That is it. But since having kids, all of that has changed. Um, and storytelling has really become a part of my life. Kids do not respond to, you know, to, to anything really. <laughs> kids don't respond to you being like, what you've done is wrong. What you've done is wrong because of this. They're just not going to listen to that. But if you tell them a story, if you explain to them, say, oh, well, once upon a time, a character did this and then this happened and then this happened. They're so much more engaged. And because I have to tell stories, you know, repeatedly on a daily basis, I think my ability to storytell has got a little bit better. Um, Getting more adventurous in the way that you uh, explain things. There's a few um, kids' books that have come out um, and they relate to, you know, things that you want your children to learn, whether it's sharing or how to manage anger and emotions or um, being greedy, uh, things that you find difficult to explain number one, but also you can't just say, oh, you're being greedy. They don't really understand what that means. Um, and we bought a whole series of books where the characters are like hippos and giraffes, and it's, it's basically a school and it's set in a classroom and certain characters do different things and how it impacts other people in the classroom. So if someone, one of the hippos or something ate a whole cake and then obviously none of the other kids or animals in the book could eat the cake. So the whole story evolves where it helps people to understand how it hurts someone's feelings or the fact that they ate all the cake and then no one else had any um, really helps children to, to learn what the meaning is behind it. So I think it's such a valuable skill to have. And when you think about sales as well, um, or when you're selling yourself, like in an interview or if you are working in medical sales as an example, it's definitely a skill that's worthwhile understanding the concept behind so that you can create your own cool stories in order to help people remember you as a person. And maybe it's fun and creative and maybe you make people laugh and that's something that they can remember um, rather than just focusing on, on the facts. Um, so it's really it's really interesting that this is one of the skills that you've chosen to talk about today. And I wasn't actually expecting this to be one of the topics that came up in our conversation. And obviously, when I read through our notes, I was like, oh, this is really valuable. I can see where you're coming from. But it wasn't something that I thought about in terms of industry. And I'm sure other people are quite surprised to hear it as well. Um, but yeah, great information. And our third skill is all about delivering. Delivering. <laughs> Again. <laughs> Something else which you um, might not kind of come across as a, um, a skill that pharmacists need to utilize uh, on a day-to-day -day basis, but again, a really valuable skill. So tell us more about your thought processes here. Yes. So, um, you know, your listeners might be thinking, delivering? Really? That's not even a skill. But what I mean by delivering is um, making sure that you can deliver on a project. You can deliver on a promise. You can deliver on what it is that you say, you say that you're going to do. And this skill is really important because I think for a lot of us, we don't really, um, we're not really consciously aware of what we say we're going to do. Sometimes, you know, someone will ask us to do something and we'll just say, yeah, yeah, yeah. And we'll add it to our list. And our list becomes longer and longer and longer and longer. And sometimes you might not deliver on something that you say you're going to deliver on. And by over-promising, so by telling someone that you're going to do something and then not delivering on it is a sure way to screw up your career, right? Because you become known as someone who, who can't deliver. And you want to be known as someone who can deliver. You want to be known as someone who can deliver and can deliver consistently. So not only can you do your project, but you can do it consistently. So you, every time you say you'll do something, the person knows it will get done. You will be known as someone who's reliable, who's trustworthy, who, who just gets stuff done. And that will open up so many doors for you. So delivering is, is incredibly important. I think what we sometimes do is um, sometimes we can be a little over ambitious. We can 
you know, at the beginning of the year, or when you kind of sit down and you think about, okay, what do I want to achieve this year? What am I going to do? What's on my, my development plan? And you think of all of these high ticket items that you want to deliver on for your business, for your team, for your own development plan so that you can look good, so that you can progress your career. And you put all of these things down. And as the year progresses, the unexpected comes along. And all these things that you'd planned to do now come way down on your list and you have to do the unexpected, the high priority things. So now you've overpromised. You've overpromised on uh, and and you've underdelivered. So for me, I think the biggest tip would be don't overpromise. Make sure that you pick two or three high ticket items, put that down on your development plan, put that down on your goals, and then Save some capacity for the unexpected. Save some capacity for career development. Save some capacity for annual leave and bake that all into your plan. And so you can consistently deliver. I love that. And that's a really good, again, piece of advice to to give. And with regards to goal setting, it could be your personal goals as well as your professional goals. And I think it's quite challenging to find that kind of big ticket item and breaking it down into manageable steps and seeing where you can fit that in. As parents, this is hard because our kids for sure get in our way. Whether the the viruses come into play at nursery, we've had to wake up a million times overnight to deal with a child and then that fatigue it kicks in. And then you find it hard to motivate yourself the next day to do whatever it is you need to do. I've had to completely kind of rethink what it is that I can achieve. And though my goals are still big, they're probably not as crazy as they were before I had children in my life. Because I have to ensure that I have the headspace, the patience, the emotional health and the actual time to be able to achieve the goals that I'm trying to to get done. So um, I feel like the kids are usually my main barrier to success. Um, not in a bad way. I love them. But um, you know, it's it's a real shift, isn't it? And episode three is all about that. So we'll go th- about that in, you know, in detail. But again, like we've talked a really good amount about networking, um, storytelling and delivering. So there's a really good place for people to start in terms of understanding the skills that they need to work on and maybe understanding skills that are different to the normal, you know, traditional skills that you would expect of a pharmacist. So, you know, thanks for sharing your experience and also uh, the stories behind them as well. I think that's a really useful place for people to kind of grasp the concept of what you were talking about. Um, Episode three is coming out um, next week, which even if you're not a mum, will be an amazing episode for you guys to tune into. We will be talking a lot about juggling parenting alongside our careers. And a lot of that comes down to productivity, time management strategies, and making sure that we achieve our goals in in an effective way. So next week, watch out for this episode. And I hope you guys have enjoyed this one.